Hey, John here. Let's look at what it means to run more than one processor at a time. All right, let's start with where we used to be. Where did we start, right? What is a CPU? In the simplest of terms, a CPU has what? It has registers in it. And I'm going to write a little block diagram in here. Those are my registers. It has an ALU, right? This kind of builds this loop here, right? Registers go into the ALU, ALU does an operation. The results can be stored back into the registers. Yeah, there's more going on, but in the simple abstract term, that's what you got. You got a program counter here, and you've got some sort of finite state machine over here that whose purpose is to orchestrate the operation of everything else in here, right? So over the course of time, this thing says this register goes here, a different register goes on, you know, the other input of the ALU, the output stores back over there, please advance the program counter, and so on. This finite state machine also controls the memory bus, right? Memory, I'll abbreviate that, abbreviate that like this, okay? Down here we have memory. So what did programs look like, you know, 30 years, of, oh, geez, 40 years ago, right? Circa, uh, you know, in the late 1970s, right? 1970. Uh, how did these things work? You had operating systems with names like CPM, right? So like CPM. You had, you know, your TRS-80s and your Apple IIs and stuff like that. All these machines kind of work the same way. And the way they treated the memory, all right, let's draw a memory map, right? Let's look at our, from, they still use the familiar address space that we have today. Now there's a little more to it than this, but I'm gonna keep it simple here. You had your text data, your BSS and your heap, and you had your stack. And literally, you had 64K, so that was the full address, 4X digits, okay? For the most part, they work this way. These things had names like the Transient Program Area, the TPA, and, but they all had stacks, and they always had these uh, full descending stacks that would work their way down. The uh, These things down here may have been in different orders and organized in other ways just due to the uh, the uh, inability of the CPUs at the time to store them in the, the currently modern standard way that we do it now, right? Uh, but for the most part, you kind of had this sort of thing going on. And the CPU would do one thing at a time. It would fetch instructions out of the executable code area, the text, right? It would read from the data regions and so on, push stuff and pop stuff in the stack and all this fun stuff. So this you could say maybe is maps over like this, right? So that memory block really is this view here. Okay, we run, what does this then mean? It runs one program at a time. One prog at a time. All right. And this is fine, provided that you don't have, you know, multiple things going on in your life. Uh, one, just being able to run one program at a time was truly awesome for a long time versus running zero programs at all or having to walk into the office and log into a mainframe and things like that. I mean, the amount of overhead was horrific. So just this was earth shattering in 1978, 79, 1980. So this style of computing was the predominant method of, of all of personal computing, all right? Mainframe computing had already moved on to what we're familiar with now with multiple processes and stuff like that. But personal computing, this is all we had. And mainframe computing, by the way, in 1960s was a lot like this too. So the personal computing environment, it was about 15, maybe 20 years lagging behind the mainframe uh, architectures at the time. Now, after a while, people kind of got bored with this and just said, I really want to do more than one thing at a time. So what they did is they said, look, I'm going to do this. Instead of using the memory like this, I'm going to reorganize how this works. I'm going to put text data. I'm not going to write it all out like this. I'm going to just say text data, heap, okay? We'll just merge these two together, okay? for simplicity's sake. It's still text data BSS heap, but you know, too much to write. I'm lazy. I'm old and lazy, get over it. So the heap grows up and so on, all right? Now, let's call this one for process zero, okay? And maybe there'd be a stack in here. 
Okay. So process in this would and then of course grow down. So instead of using all the memory for one big process, let's put two processes in there. All right? Process one. Uh, these are ones, okay? This is process zero. And this is process one. And I saved a little bit of space up here, all right? This now becomes the operating system save area. Now, what this is for is we have one CPU that can only do one thing at a time. And normally it would look like this, but fancier machines, we would write different software and would say, look, put a program here, different program up here. This program would run. And every now and then he would voluntarily yield and say, you can stop me now and run any other processes if you want to right now. So he might have a loop. It would go, you know, maybe he's, you know, calculating Fibonacci numbers or solving uh, the largest uh, uh, um, prime number search or something like that that would run on forever, right? And every now and then after every thousand times it would go through its loop, it would say yield to some other process. And maybe this other process would be doing something else similar to that. Or maybe he's, you know, doing word processing or running a spreadsheet or something like that. And when uh, this process is interacting with a user, all right, and they're waiting for somebody to hit a key on a keyboard, this process would voluntarily yield and say, you know, there's nothing for me to do, so yield back to some other process. And it would then go back to calculating prime numbers or something like that while waiting for a user to type in some keystrokes. Now, this area up here is where the operating system would keep track of all these processes because it is you could have two, you could have 10, you could have 50 in here. You could have all you want, all right? Now, what we're talking about here is what we call cooperative. Uh, I got no room for this. Cooperative multitasking. All right. The way the way this memory up here is used is if this program is running. Okay, it has all its data in the in the registers and in the program counter. And if your CPU has flags and other such things, this state all in is my point that is stored in the CPU is not stored in the memory in this processes region over here. So if you want to stop this process and run something else, you have to unload everything that's in the CPU and put it somewhere. Okay, so what happens is you have the process zero. Let's just call this one the process zero save area. And what goes in here is if this process zero says, okay, I'll yield to somebody else, what happens is he does that by calling a subroutine up here. Maybe there's some code up here, right? This is the text for the operating system itself. And this code up here would take all the registers, put them in process zero save area, take the program counter and everything else from where this guy over here called up into the operating system, right? One of the things that happens when you call a subroutine, remember, is that the program counter is saved in the stack or in a special register for the return address, right? So as long as all that's available, when this thing says, I'll yield now, it can store all that into this save area. And it can have another save area for process one. Okay. And to switch between these two processes, all that has to happen if this guy down here calls yield, yield staves everything that's running right now in here, and then loads all the registers from the save area here, and it grabs the address that was the return address from the that was in the program counter the last time this process called yield. And in doing so, you're basically branching, right? If you put the, if, you, if there's an address in here and you store it in the program counter, you've effectively branched back to wherever you're supposed to go to return from the last subroutine call, which would have by definition been to call the yield inside the operating system. So if you would write programs this way, 
and everybody behave themselves, big caveat there, right? As long as none of these programs, uh, you know, if this guy started storing data down here, it would ruin the, you know, all the data stuff for process zero. And then uh, when he, when this guy calls yield and, and everything's restored to resume process zero already in progress, then uh, all of its memory would have been corrupted and the thing will clearly crash or do something disastrous. And along the way, probably also wreck all the uh, memory here, possibly even wreck the operating system up here. So in order for this to work, everyone has to be absolutely perfect in every way. Otherwise, the entire house of cards comes tumbling down. And that was what life was between 1980 and 2000, uh, mostly due to the way the CPU vendors and Microsoft and uh, Apple wrote their operating systems to allow all this sort of thing to happen. We'll talk more about things like virtual memory and other things later on in another time that allows us to protect against this, which is why things work better today than they did 25 years ago. Okay, the, the takeaway here is that if I have a single CPU and a single bunch of memory, I can either do this, which by the way is incredibly secure, incredibly safe, because CPUs back in these days did not have the ability to update their boot ROMs and anything else. They were physically immutable machines. If you loaded a program and ran it, there was nothing else around to tweak or to corrupt or steal. And when this was done, usually this would be stored on like a floppy disk or something. You'd take the floppy disk out of the machine, put another floppy in, and run a different program. Those days were very simple days. But it was also slow, and you can only do one thing at a time. So pros and cons, all right? You want to have a severely <laughs> insecure, easy to crash, chronically broken system that can do a lot of things in a little bit amount of time, you use this one. If you want a system that works perfectly all the time, and well, that doesn't work perfectly. It works, oddly, it, it works just as well as this, arguably, in fair, all fairness. They work as well as each other. However, when this style system has a problem, it affects one and only one process. It does not infect other processes, and there's no way to corrupt other things in your computer system, okay? Because they're just not there. If they are there, then you can cause all kinds of problems. This process can steal passwords out of the data in the memory down here. Yeah, this was not a good time. <laughs> this was an insecure time in our lives. But this is how this worked, all right? So what does this all mean? A single CPU can run more than one process at a time. That's what I'm getting with, at with this, all right? In what we would call cooperative multitasking. Now, having said all that, that's not to suggest that there's no value of cooperative multitasking. It turns out this, uh, when used in systems that are not desktop personal computers filled with programs that are all coming and going and written by different vendors for different purposes, uh, if you don't do that with it, it can be perfectly fine. For example, this is used in very small compute systems like... Um, uh, that are running things like uh, railroad crossing gates uh, or like water treatment plants and things like that. There's an enormous amount of control systems and embedded processors on small systems where price is a concern that does have single CPU or even they might actually have multiple CPUs in there. We'll talk about that in a minute but they still can use cooperative multitasking very effectively. The bottom line is the programs that they execute are all written to go together and they're tested together and they're known to be secure and they know that this process is not going to clobber that one and so on. So this can be used quite effectively and very cost effectively is even more uh, the point here. All right. It all depends on that kind of operating system that you use and the kind of programs or processes that you start firing up in this environment. Okay. Now, if we wanted to, we can take more than one CPU I'm going to leave these boxes empty. We don't need to look at the guts. We know what's inside there, right? CPU zero, CPU number one. What if we took two separate CPUs, connected their memory buses together, and do this? Okay, 
All right. First of thing we notice is somehow we have to prevent these two things from getting in each other's way when they're interacting with the memory. Okay. So in the simplest mechanism, you can basically run these so that they go round robin as far as the memory is concerned. So uh, one of these CPUs can fetch an instruction or interact with memory. And then when it's executing the instruction, the other one can interact with memory, fetching an instruction or loading data or whatever. And then it can process an instruction. And when this one's processing, this guy can then be fetching the next instruction. And this can kind of go back and forth like this. All right. This is what we call round robin. Okay, and it's the simplest way to deal with what we would call arbitration. And I put the arrow up here because what we have to deal with is providing some form of arbitration to decide which one of these CPUs can interact with the memory at any given time. Now, if we choose round robin for the arbitration, it turns out it's very straightforward. You simply run these two CPUs essentially 180 degrees out of phase with each other, which allows the circuitry inside here to be fairly simple, okay? We don't need to go into the details. It's a combinational circuit. Now, if we build a machine like this, and we put two processes in the memory... All right, let's just say process zero and process one. All right, and again, we might have some operating system stuff up here to keep track of what's going on. Now, both of these CPUs can run at the exact same time. This is a 100% increase in performance provided that this, what we call this bottleneck, right? So some terminology, right? This is the memory bottleneck, and this will come back to haunt us later on. So keep that in mind, the memory bottleneck. As long as the memory here can run, let's say, twice as fast as any one of these CPUs and provide as much access and data flowing back and forth in out of this memory to keep both of these busy at their maximum speed, we're fine, okay? And in that case, we're getting twice as many instructions executed in the same unit of time, which is why it's 100% faster. It's running at 200% speed, which is, you know, 100% again, as if we had only a single CPU, so we can get actually more work done. And these two processes do not need to cooperate. They need to not clobber each other's memory, but they both continuously free run now. Now, of course, there's other problems that come along, like what happens if uh, one of these wants to talk to the keyboard while another one's reading data from a user? Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the responsibility of the operating system, okay? That's left as a, a, a lecture for another time, all right? Let's not worry about that. Let's just look at mechanically kind of what's going on and get some terminology down. Now, in the first generation of doing things like this, this is roughly kind of how it was done. All right, you would have two physically separate CPUs. Even if they were single chip CPUs, there would be two chips sitting on your motherboard and your computer that would do this. All right, and those two chips would go into sockets. So, what we would in today's terminology, this is what we'd call a socket. All right, one of the ways we would refer to this. So we could say this is a two-socket system, or we could say this is a system with two CPUs, all right? Now, it wasn't long before somebody noticed that it would be cheaper and easier to build the physical computer, the motherboard and all that, if we took these two CPUs and put them all on one chip. You build a machine now. I'm going to go over to blue now to draw this new diagram. Hopefully that shows up a little bit different. So now we have one socket. Again, I'm going to put quotes around that. And inside this socket, we have two CPUs. All right. In one socket. Now we go over to the memory. Like this. 
So the actual physical computer board would have one physical chip with one physical memory bus, right? One physical memory. This physically looks a lot like this, okay? So it turns out that the machine that you build the physical manifestation of this machine is the same as this one. That's an economical gain, big time. All right? So what's happening in here? What's Where did this go? Well, that turns out to be inside of this socket. All right? So it's all really the same thing, but by putting both of these CPUs in one single physical socket, it keeps the physical machine, the embodiment of the computer as a whole, nice and simple. And people that design these things don't have to worry about figuring out how to make all this work. Put it off on this uh, Intel or Zillog or somebody like that to figure out how to do it inside the socket so I don't have to. The guy with the soldering iron doesn't have to do it down here. Okay? Big economical gain, but you end up with the same sort of a thing here. Now, somewhere along the way, somebody decided that these two CPUs inside this socket were going to be called cores. All right? So this is really what a core is. Equals one. Uh, I, I'm afraid to write one CPU here because today a lot of people refer to the entire socket as a CPU. So this is one of those things where a word that had very specific meaning 40 years ago now doesn't mean anything anymore because people use it in all kind of random ways. But I'm going to put CPU in here, I guess, anyway, with quotes around it because all these words become nebulous once salespeople start using them incorrectly, all right? And that's kind of what happens. Every decade, everything gets screwed up. And then we have to invent new terminology because no one knows what they're talking about anymore. Then that gets all misapplied, misunderstood, and so on. And this, this just goes on for decade after decade. So anyway, point is, if you have, if I call each one of these thingies inside the socket a CPU, or if I call it a core, there's one of these for each of those, all right? Roughly speaking today, one core still pretty much means what used to be one whole CPU. Now, you could imagine that as you add more and more of these cores to one socket, there's a diminishing return, right? I mean, th th this memory bus can only go so fast. And even, you know, the fastest ones today are on the order of, um, well, what's the fastest memory you can buy? I haven't looked in a while. About one gigahertz is the speed of these buses, right? So, you know, oh, I got a five gigahertz, you know, CPU, which really is socket, and it's got all these cores in here. What does that really mean? Is each one of these going at 5 gigahertz, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30 gigahertz worth of data moving in and out of these cores all at the same time? And then it goes through this bottleneck. So, uh, uh, yes, that's what it means, okay? <laughs> now, uh, granted, if you've got a 5 gigahertz CPU and it's running an Intel uh, uh, type architecture or what is technically actually the AMD 64 architecture, that's what we're running, even on an Intel chip. It's the AMD 64 Instruction set architecture. AMD actually invented it. Uh, long story, 20 years old. I'll save you the details. Anyway, if you install Linux, it'll actually say AMD64 because that's what it is. Uh, so what's my point? If you're running this instruction set, it's very complicated. And if even if your chip runs, each one of these cores is running at 5 gigahertz, I can assure you that you're not running one extra one instruction for each one of those clock cycles all right those require many cycles each so let's say then that you have these six cores and you have a super fancy uh, cpu socket that runs at six gigahertz and each one of them takes six cycles to do their job then all this kind of divides out right so that means that each one of these will only do one thing every six clock cycles so the whole thing is getting uh then it would require six uh, gigahertz of memory bandwidth. So the thing would be stalled, in other words, more than 80% uh, of the time. 
which is a problem, okay? That's not very efficient. Now, there's ways around that. You, uh, you can actually hook up more than one memory. This starts looking a little bit like a Harvard machine in that case. And this is, if you buy CPUs today and they're running double speed, this is what it's doing. It's running two separate physical memory interfaces all at the same time. But uh, they are still von Neumann machines because the way this works on current modern processors, like in the one on the desktop that's recording this video right now, this memory might be uh, all memory addresses between zero and, I don't know, one zero 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 zero, And this one might be one zero 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 to two zero 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 zero, and so on. So half of it's here, half of it's there. And when you run your programs, if you divide them up through memory like this, and you put one program in, in one of these physical memories and another program, oops, another program over here in a different physical memory, then what happens is... This core can interact with this memory at full speed, and that core can go in this memory at full speed. And you end up with more throughput, we say, right? So what is throughput, right? What is bandwidth? What is all this, right? So bandwidth, these are networking terms. This is like data per time. Okay, in some unit of time, if this thing runs at one gigahertz, you would say then that would be one billion uh, memory units of, of data could move across this bus per second. And this thing here, if this was one gigahertz, the combination of the two is two gigahertz, all right? So you speak of bandwidth. That's the rate of which you can move data back and forth in here, all right? And throughput, this is like work per time. So data per time has to do pretty much with buses and networks and things like that. Throughput would be how much of this program runs per unit of time or how much total instructions and programs can operate per unit of time, right? How much work did this socket do in the last one second? Well, if it has two cores in it, it does twice as much work as it does if it has only one core in it, all right? So the, the, just a little bit more terminology, because I'll probably just throw these words out, and you I might make sure that you know what they mean. And, of course, you can Google them. I'm, I'm sure that Wikipedia has a, a whole page dedicated to each of these terms. All right. So, so far we got cores. We have sockets. Socket is kind of synonymous with CPU, all right? To this day, that's still true, okay? If I say socket or CPU, I'm talking about the same one physical embodiment of a thing uh, stuck on a circuit board, all right? Now, inside of these can be all these cores. Now, let's make one more leap here because there's some other terminology, right? Now, I'm going to say that one core is one processing element, and I'm going to put quotes around this, okay? Because this is a thing that's kind of nebulous, all right? A lot of people use core to mean different things. I think that we can all agree that one core is something that can execute instructions independent of what's happening on these other cores. Okay, I'm going to put C's on the core, core, core. Right? That's what I mean when I say one processing element. It is self-contained. It is autonomous. It does its own thing. Now, let's talk about hyperthreads. Circle R, okay, registered trademark by Intel, all right? Let's not use that word, okay? Because people don't say this right anyway. They quite often say threads. This doesn't mean anything when you're talking about CPUs. This just shows that somebody's being lazy, and I'm guilty of that too. This is an annoying term, okay? What they really mean to say is SMT. SMT here means simultaneous multi-threading, okay? Now, I'm going to abbreviate simultaneous multi-threading. Okay, now again, this evil word thread shows back up in here. Let's make sure we know the difference between a thread from the perspective of a running program and a thread from the perspective of the hardware, okay? Now, if we go back and look at this again, each of these two processes running is really a thread. I'm going to put a T next to them. This is a thread of execution. 
okay? That's what a process really is. So there's a thread of execution affiliated with this process and a thread of execution affiliated with this process here, all right? So we're running two threads here. We might call these coarse threads because these are completely autonomous threads, okay? Now, there's another kind of thread, all right? Now, I'm leaping forward a little bit. Try to bear with me here. Let's say I have a memory of the machine, and it's bare, and it's, um, and it's partitioned like this. Dot, 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 because there could be more processes and operating system stuff up there, right? This thing here could actually have more than one thread in it. This one might only have one thread. So what the heck does this mean versus this? When an entire process that runs completely independent of all other processes has a thread like this one here, it needs a core to run that process. It needs to make sure it's not interfered with in any way by anything else that's running. It is sharing very little, you could say, with any other process that might be running on this machine as a whole. Okay? So this is independent. Okay? If you have two threads running in the same process, all right? And uh, off the top of my head, one simple example might be that... Let's say this process has a graphic display that's animating, and maybe it's drawing these lines while it waits for you to do something with a keyboard, or maybe it's reading a file, okay? That's a better example, reading a file. So this thread here might be running an animation. This thread down here might be reading a file. Right, so maybe this is that little spinner thing on your desktop, spinning around and around and around. Maybe there's a thread that's doing that. This separate thread over here might be reading from a disk or something like that, okay? These are independent, but the point is they're sharing something. They're sharing the address space of this process. So this is sharing, and I'm gonna abbreviate like this, address space, okay? What does that mean? It means that the code that is executing the graphic animation is in the same text region data BSS. It's in the same address space as the code that's reading data from a file. Why? Because like you know, I, this guy says, oh, enter the name of a file, and I'm going to read it in, and maybe it's a text editor or something. And while it's reading the file, it animates something on the screen to let you know that that's taking time and, and it's going on, right? So you have these two things going on at the same time. Both of them are in the same memory space, has nothing to do with any other process, is the point, okay? If you do this, it turns out that you can save money and you can create cheaper cores in your CPU socket. So what are the implications of that? All right, let's draw a big one here so we can look inside it a little bit. Well, the implications are that one core now can have two hyper threads if we're going to use Intel's terminology. Oops. So if you have two cores with two hyper threads, you'd have something that looks like this now. Okay? And so on for over here. Now, these two hyperthreads, provided that they are sharing a lot of common resources, can be simpler than an entire core. All right, so this suggests then that the core really has like multiple parts to it. So there's something shared between these two hyperthreads. So what is shared between these two hyperthreads is a subject of a completely different uh, conversation. But the short of it is 
there are certain things that don't matter if you're sharing an address space. One of such of those things is the, the address space uh, management. which has to do with the security, okay? So if these threads are bound together by the, by the needs of this common process, if any one of them fails, the whole process dies anyway, you don't have to worry as much about the security of keeping this thing isolated from this other one and so on, right? So the hardware that does that is the kind of thing that's in here. There's other things that are shared as well, like a cache. So uh, that too is a subject of a whole nother discussion. So the security, this is like virtual memory management. All right, and by that, I mean the MMU, memory management unit. That's one of the things that might be shared between these two hyper threads. What else could be in there? A cache, okay? This is a thing that keeps a copy of memory that has been recently uh, accessed, right? So if you put the main memory in this diagram, all right, one of the things that happens is if you write a program that looks like this, it's got a loop in it. Most programs have a loop. So if there's a bunch of instructions in here, in order to execute the contents of this loop and then come back up and around like this, you're going to execute the same instructions again and again and again and again. Well, you know, the first time through this loop, you've read them all out of memory into the CPU anyway to be executed. If you just throw them away and then later on you come around again, you got to fetch them all over again. So what happens is inside here, you can have a cache, all right? You can have a, I'm going to put an M in there because I didn't leave myself enough room for the MMU. There's some other things in here. Now, it's okay, my point is, to share the cache across these hyper threads because they're all part of the same address space anyway. You do not want to share the cache of this process with the cache of the one down here. That would just be annoying for reasons that'll be obvious if we talk at great length about how caches work at some other time. The short of it is that one process can cause the cache to fill up with all the stuff for it, and the other one would starve, okay? So it's just a problem. If these two hyperthreads are working at this on the same uh, address space at the same time, this cache can be shared far more effectively than it can be across two separate cores running totally unrelated processes, right? So this would be over here like that. There'd be a cache and a memory management unit and other things. So what's the difference then between a core and a hyperthread, right? Well, in this scenario up here, when we didn't have hyperthreads, this core included its own cache, its own MMU, a lot of things in here. Now, if you don't need all these to be separate, you can have kind of like this, eh, kind of a lame core, an almost core, okay? And save a lot of money is the point. And power, energy consumption, right? Less transistors, less power, and all this other stuff. It turns out that if you use these two hyper threads like this, on average, it's arguable. It can be anywhere between zero to maybe 30% improvement in performance of the system. Obviously, if I add two cores, I have 100% improvement, all right? But given one core, by just creating hyper threads, I get a little bit of an improvement here. And you can, add, in theory, it could actually run slower if it's not used correctly, okay? You'll see any range of numbers uh, quoted anywhere on the internet for certain applications. It's very difficult to assess the value of hyperthreading, right? Because they share something and it really depends on what the two threads are doing in any given program at any given time. This is open to wide debate, okay? What's not open to wide debate is what happens when you put two cores in one socket. You double the speed of the processor, okay? So what's better, more cores or more hyperthreads? Well, it, <laughs> it depends on what you need, but in the simplest of terms and ignoring power consumption and cost, you would like to get more cores because you can do anything you want with 
two cores, right? They don't have to be executing the same process at the same time. But the two cores can be doing the same process at the same time. In the case we have multiple threads like this, not a problem, okay? So cores are far more flexible than hyper threads, okay? So I hope you now know a little bit more about what an MMU is for, even a cache at this point. You may not know how these work, but you know what they do. You know what the terminology means. You know then what a core is. You know what a socket is, right? You know what bandwidth and throughput mean, okay? So now we're going to have conversations about what it means to manage an address space and the implications of security and things like that. Before we go, let's make sure that we all know that we can combine all these things into one system, right? What can you do? Even with a single CPU, right? You can have cooperative uh, multitasking, all right? And you can do this with one CPU or two CPUs or N, you know, CPUs or N cores. And you can even do it with N uh, hyper threads, all right, or SMT. Okay? Yes, you can do this. What kind of multitasking do you do if it's not cooperative? All right, we haven't talked about that yet, but we'll talk about that later after we talk about interrupts and timing and so on. But it's called preemptive multitasking, all right? The way this works is the uh, hardware will automatically decide when it's time to yield one process to another one. So or I'm going to just say, in summary right now, this is the hardware. Uh, what's the D out? Hardware decides, I'll put that in quotes, when uh, each process you know, should yield All right when it's preempted, okay? You stop, next guy's turn goes now, okay? That's done in hardware. This is much more secure than than cooperative, right? Because you can always write a process that forgets to yield and then steals all the resources of the machine, starves everybody else out. This solves that problem, okay? We'll go into that later. The point now is there is another kind and this too can run with one cpo two cpus whatever you want okay both of these can be used either one of these in fact could be used with uh however many cpus and hardware threads and so on you've got right so these are uh, disjoint now exactly how an address space is you know created or shall we say started, is a, a topic for how an operating system would work, okay? That's up to the operating system. It's the code in the operating system that initializes everything, puts all the text data, BSS, and so on into the memory, sets all the registers up, and creates all the save areas, everything else, for an address space before a process is started. That's a course in its own right, okay? That's a subject to the operating system. Security, as you can see, is probably somewhat difficult if you're going to do cooperative, right? Because in cooperative multitasking, what happens is uh, 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 you you have to count on all the processes behaving themselves. And they can, provided that they're all designed and tested and, and verified to work correctly in a unit. Okay, there's no problem with that, okay? If you can't trust them, you start using preemptive multitasking, uh, uh, and you use uh, the memory management units, to protect one address space from another and so on, okay? That's what security is really all about. This is mostly the MMU and the timer that's used to decide in a preemptive multitasking system when it's the next guy's turn, okay? So all these factors start coming into play if you want to run more than one process on your machine at the same time, okay? If you do, 
you got to start asking questions about all this stuff up here. If you don't, you and, and you only want to run one process, and it has only one thread of execution, you certainly don't need multiple cores or multiple CPUs and all this other stuff. You certainly don't need cooperative multitasking, because by definition, if there's only one task, only one thread, okay, there's only one thing to do, the, this goes away, that goes away, there's only one address space, so you don't really have to care about how it's kind of created. You can just compile it directly into the... Um, it is itself the operating system, okay? We can talk a little bit about how that works when we talk about freestanding programs at another time. You certainly don't have to worry about security anymore either because there's only one thing. The one thing is everything. So the only thing it can do is destroy itself. So you don't really need security either. All this comes into play as soon as you decide to do more than one thing at a time. All right? So thanks for watching. See you next time.